It's nearly five o'clock and it's shaping to be a fine autumn evening. The view from the terrace is wonderful. Long fingered shadows stretch out across the south front, sweeping over the slope between the house and the lake. The water is busy with birds, mallard, teal, widgeon, Canada geese, the occasional goosander, a few cormorants and nearly 50 swans, more than I can ever remember. Inside, evening light pours into the gallery, the largest and most spectacular room in the house, illuminating the Renaissance paintings, El Greco, Del Piombo, Bellini, Titian and Veronese, ancient oils glowing rich and warm in the sun. Time now to start turning on the lights, elaborate torchere by Chippendale, a grand chandelier in the music room where the last rays of sun catch and sparkle in the glass. The low sun makes its own rhythm down the orfiade, shade, light, 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 shade, running nearly a hundred yards down the whole length of the house. On evenings such as this, this is a magical place, both outside and in. And that, of course, is just how Edwin Lassells, who commissioned the house's building in the mid-18th century, intended it to be. He employed the finest artists and craftsmen of his time to make sure he got it right. York architect John Carr for the Palladian exterior, the young rising star from Scotland, Robert Adam, for the interiors, and Lancelot Capability Brown for the landscape. He commissioned furniture of all kinds, from the grandest to the simplest, by one of the greatest craftsmen England has ever produced, Thomas Chippendale, born in the little market town of Otley, a few miles up the Wharf Valley. This was Chippendale's biggest single commission, started by him and completed some 30 years later by his son, Thomas Chippendale Jr. But this is not only a beautiful house full of beautiful things and a beautiful landscape, it's also a home. Ten generations of my family have lived here from 1771 when Edwin first occupied the new house right up to the present day. My father moved in with his parents in 1930 when he was seven and he died here also in 2011, 81 years later. I was born and went to school in London, but my brothers and I would spend much of our holidays here and many of my childhood memories are here also. Winters are especially vivid. The hoar frost clinging thick to the branches, breath billowing in great white clouds and the lake freezing over, begging for us to go skating on it. The library would become the family room at Christmas. Log fire blazing and presents brought through from what was then my grandmother's sitting room not to be opened until after lunch, which was a real test of the young boy's patience. But for kids, it was a wonderful playground and it's a delight to see my grandchildren enjoying it now. They treat it rather more respectfully than my brothers and I often did. We played games of indoor football upstairs that sometimes became so vigorous that we would be told off for rattling the chandeliers below. We would play elaborate practical jokes on each other particularly what is now called below stairs, the old kitchens, the servants' hall and the sub-hall. These were murkily lit rooms with strangely shaped piles of furniture covered in dust sheets, quite spooky for young kids. And so, of course, we would hide under the sheets and leap out at each other with blood-curdling yells. It was very enjoyable, unless you were on the receiving end. I hope all visitors leave here with their own particular memory. It could be of a painting or of a magnificent piece of Chippendale furniture. It could be of the sweep of Brown's landscape or the formal floral splendour of Barry's Terrace. Or of something as simple as the patina on an old leather book on a mahogany bookcase. All of these are what makes this a very special place.